thank you for being with us tonight in our time together last week. We were down to looking at the mitre, little L under five on your outline. It was to be always upon Aaron's forehead in order that the offering of the Israelites would be accepted before Jehovah. And that's verse 38. So it shall be on Aaron's forehead in order that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel hallow in all their holy gifts, and it shall always be on his forehead in order that they may be accepted before Jehovah. Give us this on over there. So accepted before Jehovah. The implication of that is if Aaron is not wearing the turban, then their sacrifices would not be accepted. Turn to Leviticus, thank you, chapter 1. What I've tried to show you in the last week and night, how Leviticus fits in to Numbers, or to Exodus, rather. And Leviticus 1 4, <coughs> then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. So here's when the burnt offering is brought. And Jehovah gives the ordination of how to accept that burnt offering. Notice there's an acceptance. And then if you look at Leviticus 22, and verse 27, when a bull or a sheep or a goat is born, it shall be seven days with its mother, and from the eighth day and thereafter, it shall be accepted as an offering made by fire to Jehovah. So qualifications in order for an offering to be accepted. Chapter 23 of Leviticus, verse 11, he shall wave the sheaf before Jehovah, to be accepted on your behalf on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And then in Isaiah 56, and verse 7. Even then, or even them, I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices is will be in italics in your translation. So their burnt offerings and their sacrifices accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. So you get the idea that qualifications must be met. And here, the high priest wearing the mitre, and in these other places where we've read, in order for offerings to be accepted. So you get the approach idea again. You have God, and you have the people. And by means of their sacrifice, they approach God. In approaching God, there are qualifications to be met. If those qualifications are met, then the sacrifice is accepted. Now what that tells us in principle when we get to the New Testament is God is not obligated to just accept anything I bring 
in any way I bring it, just because I brought it. It seems, and it's, I know it's so in the denominational world, but it's also true among some of us, that people have the idea, if I show up at the church house, God's obligated to accept whatever I present to them, or whatever attitude I present to them. That's not the case. So we need to zero in on this idea of accepting in the little elf. Any questions or comments? Well, if we didn't have revelation, we wouldn't know what to do. That's right. So we know what God wants. He told us. And one of the things you learn in Genesis 4 is that God will not accept substitutes. Cain teaches us that. So we ought to learn that in our bringing our offerings, in our approach to God. Very good. Anyone else? Or more? Little G, by offering the sacrifices for sin... <coughs> The priest bore away, key terminology there, bore away the sins of the people. All right? If we go to Isaiah 53, we know in Isaiah 53 that we are reading a prophecy of whom? Jesus. Jesus. And we know that why? Acts 8. Acts 8. Philip told us that. That's the he to whom the prophet referred. <clears throat> All right, notice this idea of bearing away sins. Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he has borne our, literally, sicknesses, borne our griefs, and carried our, literally, pains, our sorrows, Yet we esteemed, reckoned him, stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Notice, he's borne our sicknesses, our griefs. He bore them for us on Calvary. And then verse 11. He shall see the labor you may have travail of his soul, and be satisfied by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Bear their iniquities. Verse 12, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Right? He bore the sin of many. Now if you go to Hebrews chapter 9, and if you really want Hebrews to come alive, learn Leviticus. It's your background. Hebrews 9, verse 28. So Christ was offered once, <coughs> notice this, to bear the sins of many. That's exactly what Isaiah 53 said. <coughs> and the word bear there means to take upon oneself, to bear a load. Now, when you get to 1 Peter 2, and verse 24, <coughs> speaking of the Christ, who himself, look at it, bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Now, that's propitiation. Substitute offering. All right, look at Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus 10, verse 17. Why have you not eaten the sin offering in the holy place? 
since it is most holy, and God has given it to you, look at it, to bear the guilt of the congregation, to make atonement for them before Jehovah. Bear the guilt of the congregation. Then Leviticus 22, verse 16. Or allow them to bear the guilt of trespass when they eat their holy offerings, or I, Jehovah, sanctify them. So here's Aaron and his sons, and they bear the guilt of trespass in the offerings that they're doing for the people. Then go to Numbers 18. And verse 1. Then Jehovah said to Aaron, You and your sons and your father's house with you, now here it is, shall bear the iniquity, you may have a marginal reading, guilt, related to the sanctuary, and you and your sons with you shall bear the iniquity associated with your priesthood. Notice the priesthood was to bear sin, bear iniquity, bear it away from the people. And they did that through the offerings of the sacrifices. Go to Ezekiel. Chapter 4. Beginning in verse 4. Here's what Jehovah tells Ezekiel to do as an object lesson. Lie also on your left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it according to the number of the days that you lie on it you shall bear their iniquity. For I have laid on you the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days 390 days so you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when you have completed them, lie again on your right side. Then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have laid on you a day for each year. <coughs> Notice, in an object lesson, Ezekiel would lie on one side, then turn over. After those days, lie on the other side. People want to know, what are you doing? Bearing the iniquity, your iniquity, your sin, because you've sinned against Jehovah. And he's saying, because go on, he will go on to say, because of this iniquity, Jerusalem will be seized by the enemy. But I'm portraying the bearing of your iniquity. All right, with that background, go to John 1. And verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away, takes away, bears away the sin of the world. If you do not have the Old Testament picture, <coughs> of the lamb as a sin offer. This won't make any sense to you. Why is Jesus called a lamb? He is in picture the lamb of the Old Testament sacrificial system. Beginning with Abel under patriarchy and then with the law of Moses and the work of the priests, the bearing away 
of the sins. And this is what the priests do. So get the idea as to what these sacrifices offered by the priests take the sin of the people and bear these priests bear it away from a person maybe a group maybe the camp what we generally call Israel but you need to know when I say Israel I'm including the proselytes that proselyted from the Gentiles everyone who made himself amenable to the law of Moses in order to be saved bearing away the sins now here's a picture we need to get because people, Christians, many times have a hard time when they repent of sin forgiving themselves. And they have a harder time forgiving themselves than God has forgiven. So you get the picture. Turn to Leviticus 16. And verse 21, and when I say Leviticus 16, automatically, Day of Atonement ought to pop into your head. That's your recognition of Leviticus 16. Verse 21, you bring this live goat. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions, concerning all their sins. All right, there's a group. Aaron is doing all this for a group, not just an individual. Putting them on the head of the goat and shall send away into the wilderness by a suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an, un, to an uninhabited land. When you mark it, you Bible won't mark through your word. And he shall release the goat in the wilderness. Now, the picture of the scapegoat, the Osazel, is the sins are symbolically placed on the head of that goat. And he takes it out of the camp. Now question. If it's out of the camp, is it still in the camp? I don't understand why people can't see that who say there's no forgiveness in the Old Testament. If these folks weren't forgiven, only forgiven in prospect, as some people say, sin's still in the camp. So the, the goat either bore it all the way or didn't. And notice the emphasis in those verses I read on all, A-L-L, -L, all their sins, all their iniquities, all their transgressions, shall bear it away. Now, the blood of Christ, go to 1 John chapter 1, Beginning verse 5, God is light, and in him is zero darkness, no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, if we say, that's used three times in 1 John 1, it seems to be arguments that were being made by people in John's day. If we say that we are in fellowship with him and walk in darkness, that's sin. Light and darkness, opposites. We 
we lie and do not practice the truth. Circle it. But if we walk in the light as he, if you go back to verse 5 and mark God, down to verse 7 and mark he, connect the two. If we walk in the light as God is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. That's vertical. Not us and us. That's verse 4. This is us and God. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, now if you're reading from the King James of the American Standard, you have this word, cleanseth. The ETH gives you a, an idea that it's continuous tense. Cleanses. Keep on cleansing. The blood of Christ, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, does what? Continual cleanses. Keeps on cleansing, bearing away our iniquities, our sins. Cleansing. Are you clean or not clean? Now, if you rear children, you can send them to get a bath, and they might be clean or not clean. But a grown person with reasonable faculties ought to be able to clean himself when he takes a bath. And I love the illustration in the what we used to call the Jewel Miller film strips, the Visualized Bible Study series, number four, I believe it's number four, yeah, where the mechanic's hands are dirty and he takes soap and water and he washes his hands and that's symbolic of one being baptized into Christ and washing away the sin. So as Christians, when we sin, if we repent, Acts 8, 22 to 24, we ought to forgive ourselves because if we bring this up again without ever having committed it, God won't know what we're talking about. As far as God's concerned, it's gone. That ought to help us live with ourselves a little better. Deal with the scars when we sin. Now turn to 1 Corinthians 6. Standard, I believe, know ye not. Do you not know that the unrighteous, that's not righteous, the unnegates, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, <clears throat> he, he gives you a general word, unrighteous. Then he gives you some specifics that make that category called unrighteous. This is not a, an exhaustive list, but it's the list Paul was dealing with in trying to teach the people in Corinth. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adul adulterers, and you have the old translations, nor effeminate, the new translations, nor homosexuals, nor abusers of themselves with men, the newer translation, sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Now go back to verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? All right, he lists this category of what it, may, what it takes to make up this category of unrighteous. And he concludes it by saying, will inherit the kingdom of God. So you have bookends to show you, I'm talking about the unrighteous. Here are specific examples of what it means to be unrighteous. All right? That's a pretty sorry list, isn't it? <coughs> All right, you're guilty. 
or you were guilty. All right, now notice, you're guilty of these things. You obey the gospel. Now, how should you look at yourself? Look at verse 11. And such were, past tense. All right, if you were, what does that imply? You no longer are. You are not now. So quit treating yourself like you still are. I believe this parallel helps us when we try to deal with people who are always on an everyday guilt trip over the same things. That they have not recommitted. They just won't let it go. They won't forgive themselves. They have a trouble with that. Now, if the scapegoat took the sins out of the camp, were they in the camp or out of the camp? If you were these things, were you that in the past or are you still that in the present? You were in the past, so you're no longer that in the present. What made the difference? Notice. Circle it. You were, but. You were washed. But you were set apart, sanctified. But, see, but being used for emphasis here, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All right? That, those are three ways of saying you obeyed the plan of salvation. That's what obeying the plan of salvation does for you. It washes you clean. It sets you apart for the full service of God. And it makes you just like you had never sinned. Pronounces you just. Now if you're just, you're not unjust. Alright? If you're just, if you're washed, if you're set apart, you are not unrighteous. Even though you committed one of these sins, they go in the category of unrighteous. But you've had all that washed away. You're not that person anymore. All right, now, these folks in Corinth have done that. Should they feel guilty or innocent? Mm -hmm. Ought to be innocent. Now, notice this. Look at Acts 8. When Simon the sorcerer tried to buy the ability to lay hands on people and confer the miraculous gifts. Verse 20, Peter said to him, Your money perished with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion or lot in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. All right, that tells you where unrighteousness begins. The heart. We think it, then we do it. We don't do it, then think it. So your heart is not right. Get your heart right. How are you going to get your heart right? How does Peter tell Simon, if you want to play on words, you, you'll get mixed up if you're not careful. How does Simon tell Simon to get his heart right in the sight of God. And pray. Okay, there's a coordinating conjunction that joins things with equal rank there, isn't it? What is repentance? <coughs> what is repentance? <coughs> Change your mind of the welfare, change your lifestyle. It's the change of the mind. That's repentance. The fruit of repentance is what? Change your lifestyle. Change your lifestyle. So the change of mind brought about 
the change of the lifestyle, and it can't be reversed. You won't change your lifestyle until you change your mind about your lifestyle. You with me? All right, so change your mind about trying to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit with money. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the what? Thought of your heart may be forgiven you. All right, there are two verses there that stress not what he did, but what he thought. What he thought. If you want to change people, you have to change their thinking, and you can't browbeat people into changing their thinking. What does it take to get you to change your thinking? Well, that's what changing your thinking is. What does it take to bring that about? No, that's what repentance is. You have to be convinced. And what does it take to convince you? The gospel. I'm sorry? The gospel. I'm just talking about you. Oh. I want you to change your mind What's it going to take to get you to do that? You have to be willing to do that. That's right. That's to be the will. What's going to get you will willing to do that? The need. Your faith. You have to see the need before you'll do it. All right. You see the need, but you don't know what to do about it. Then you're taught. I'm sorry? Then you're taught. All right. Then you learn... And when you learn, what are you learning? What you must do. All right, you're learning the information, and we call that truth. Yes, our word. Huh? What? I don't know. It goes with confirmation. Revelation. You have the revelation of God, the doctrine, the teaching, the truth. And the doctrine of God, the teaching of God, the revelation of God, in order to convince me to do right, is made up of a presentation of what? Evidence. You won't change your mind until you have evidence that what you thought was wrong. I promise you, you won't do it until you have evidence. You can tell me all day that I am wrong. I'm not going to change till you show me the evidence that I'm wrong. Now, when you're teaching somebody, that takes time. If somebody wanted to convert me to denominationalism, I promise you, it couldn't be done tonight. It couldn't be done in five one-hour <coughs> sessions. But sometimes, when we've shown that film strip, if they're not in the water, we get all discombobulated and we don't want to do it. It takes time. Sometimes it'll take you. Think about 1 Peter 3, and that godly woman had to just keep on living in front of that ungodly man until finally it got through. That takes time. But you have to present the evidence. That's why you have to know the revelation. Because that's the only evidence we have. This is wrong because this says it is. This says it's wrong here. That's why it's in there somewhere. It won't work. <laughs> so you got to show me. We all become people from Missouri when it comes to conviction, repentance, lifestyle change. Show me. Y'all do know Missouri is the show me state, right? Mm -hmm. Show me. Don't tell me. Show me. And that's why I keep saying to us, don't tell people, well, I think, well, I believe. That doesn't matter. Say, so here's what the Bible says. Open your Bible right here and see what that Bible says. Now, I didn't say that. God did. What do you
believe God's saving you. You with me? All right? When these people in the Old Testament system <coughs> were given the evidence that they had sinned and they repented of those sins and they brought these sacrifices and the priest took the sacrifices and with them brought the people to God, allowed the people by means of the sacrifices to approach God, they approached God clean or unclean? Clean or unclean? Clean. That's the only people that can approach God. Well, down here they're sinners. What made them not sinners here? The sacrifice. The sacrifice. Now that's Jesus for us. That's why he had to be sinless. That's why he had to be flesh. And when he offered himself, and here's your Hebrews argument, once for all, once for all time, then I plead his blood and his blood becomes my sacrifice that allows me to approach God. And I believe when the text says that he keeps on making intercession for us, it has reference to the work of his blood. His blood keeps on interceding so I can keep on approaching God and his blood keeps on interceding when I'm walking in the light. So I'm not willfully up here in this category of unrighteous. I'm righteous because of weakness and maturity. I sin. I repent of that sin. The blood of Christ lets me then approach God. I think our folks need to see that. And I don't think a lot of our folks understand that. So when I observe the Lord's Supper, and I'm eating the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. And we always say, don't we? This represents. This represents. What does that mean? See, we need to get Acts 20, uh, Matthew 26, 28 in our minds. This is my blood of the covenant, which is shed for many, for, in order to obtain the remission of sin. Without the blood of Christ, there is no remission. So did they receive forgiveness under the law? Say it again. Did they receive forgiveness under the law? Yes. When the sacrifice was made? Okay. Yes. It wasn't, it wasn't based upon the fact that Jesus would die for them. It was. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the argument I've had to face before. All right. And here's, here's, the, here's the problem those who make that argument have. Were the sins still in the camp or out of the camp? If they were out of the camp, they can't still be guilty. Because the priests were to bear away the guilt. If they bore away the guilt, it can't still be there. Now how? How could they be forgiven under the law when Christ had not died on the cross? Go back to Genesis 3. <coughs> would, you, would you concede that when Adam and Eve sinned, they were separated from God? Would you concede that dying you shall surely die had reference to a violent physical death? All right, we're going to have to figure out how that took place somehow. So you look in verse 21. Also for Adam and his wife, Jehovah God made tunics of skin and clothed them. All right, animals died right there. All right, their skin made physical coats. I contend this is the first sin of their blood provided spiritual coats. Their blood covered Adam and Eve. In the mind of God, 
they were forgiven. Because, now forgiveness takes place in the mind of God. Because, before the foundation of the world, in the mind of God, the Lamb was already slain. It was so sure that the devil himself couldn't prevent it. And it could be spoken of then in what we call the prophetic perfect, as though it had already happened. And if, if people want to use it, and, and you know, people I respect who are good Bible students have taught for years, they receive forgiveness in prospect, where the sins in the camp in prospect are out of the camp. We're going to have to deal with that one way or the other. These folks are going to have to deal with that. It was out of the camp in prospect, therefore it was still in the camp. If they're still in the camp, they're guilty. So the priests couldn't do their job. The sacrifices didn't do their job. But once they approached the book of Hebrews, once they were purged, they should have had no more conscience of their sins. Should have had no more conscience? Yeah. Yeah. That's no, what was, they, they, they received forgiveness at that time. Else they would have not been felt okay. the guilt. That's what the Day of Atonement was for. To renew their repentance every year to let them know you're in covenant relationship with God unless you violate this covenant. That's how their consciences could be cleansed from this guilt. They still have the consciousness of sin. I submit we do also. When our consciences are clean, I'm still aware when I see it and that I'm a sinner and I must be poor in spirit to approach God. And when you read that the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin, that's usually where they go next, what does that mean in context? That's in the context of the law of Moses. What about the people on the baker? So what does that passage have to mean by itself? By itself, the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. But it wasn't by itself. From Genesis 3, in the mind of God, it connected with the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And if that's not right, I have a problem with the sin being still in the camp. That's why I can't buy that position. I understand, I grew up here, again. I've heard it all my life, as you have. But the more I study, the more problem I have with that. <clears throat> All right, now, how do I know there had to be some kind of covering for sin for Adam and Eve? All right, come down to chapter 4, verse 1. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived, and more came, and said what? All right, I've gotten a man with the help of Jehovah's, the American standard, I think. I've gotten a man, I have acquired a man from Jehovah, the New King James. Would that indicate she's in fellowship with Jehovah or out of fellowship? Mm -hmm. Was she out of fellowship when she sinned? Yes. What happened between I'm out of fellowship and I'm in fellowship? Sacrifice. You had those animals. If that's not a sin offering, I don't know how to account for it. Chapter 3, they're out of fellowship. In verse 22, the animals die, or verse 21. And then in 4.1, she's back in fellowship with God. Now if that's not it, we're not told how she got back in fellowship with God. And if you ignore 4, it makes a whole lot more sense. You don't click, click. So that's the way I would approach it. Now, how would you approach it? You see, no, it's the acquired the acquired the man child from the help of Yahweh or Jehovah. How would you approach that? I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> Brother, you've had to approach it. I have. I have. How'd you approach it? 
I can learn from you. I just have tried to give them the evidence of what the scriptures teach about the forgiveness of sin under the old law. And they still argue and reason, no, that's not what it means. And I'll tell you part of the reason for that. I guarantee you this is part of the reason. They've never put Leviticus and Hebrews together. Life is in the blood. They've never put it together. The sin offering. That's why when they come to Hebrews 6, they cannot deal with renewed repentance. Renewed repentance is the day of atonement. That's Leviticus 16. Repentance for the nation was renewed every year on the day of atonement. Under Christianity, we have a once for all sacrifice, so there is no renewed repentance. That's why they can't deal with Hebrews 10, 26. There remains no more a sacrifice for sin if you leave Christ. Because on Pentecost, the law of Moses ended. And if you leave Christianity and go back to the law of Moses, you have animals but their, their blood can't be offered because God's not in the temple anymore. So you can't approach him through the temple. God's not approached by the Levitical priesthood anymore after Pentecost. So you don't have a priesthood. So you don't have a priesthood to sacrifice, therefore you can't approach God. You start that under patriarchy. You approach God with, pet, with priesthood and sacrifice. That's why you nail that down to start with. That's true under patriarchy, mosaic, and Christian. I guarantee you that's it. A big part of it, if not it. Because they've never put Leviticus and Hebrews Leviticus opens up here. It just says, here's, here's your background, here's your New Testament application. And notice Hebrews contrasts what? The old and the new. Well, more specifically. Better. Better covenant. Oh, we got a better. Here's what it contrasts. The priesthood of Aaron with the priesthood of Christ. Superiority. That's Hebrews. Priesthood of Aaron versus the priesthood of Christ, which is a Melchizedekian priesthood, which is a better priesthood. And here's why it's better. Once for all sacrifice for sin, no more day of atonement, no more renewed repentance. Now you have total, no more consciousness of sin. On the law, you had a remembered consciousness of it on the day of atonement. That makes sense. I hope that'll help you. That's the only way I know how to explain it. If I'm not right on that, then you have to go back to prospect. And they're still in the, I can't see how they're not still in the camp on prospect. I have a problem with that. All right, other questions or comments? What is your thoughts on then Romans 6 and 17? Then? My thoughts don't matter. What's well, your question on Romans 6 and Well, it says the exact same things that you've been saying. Now, that must be my thought on it. Exactly, then, then right? That's Paul's thought. You're free from sin. That's the Holy Spirit's thought. Yeah. We'll know you not that to whom you present yourself as bond slaves unto obedience, his bond slaves you are, whom you obey, whether of sin that leads to death, or obedience that leads to righteousness. Now, if you're righteous, you're no longer unrighteous. So you're in 1 Corinthians 6, 11. If you're unrighteous, you're in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. So you have to decide which, which of those verses is you. Um, I heard a sermon as far as on 1 Corinthians 6 there, talking about all the unrighteous there, that he, he was saying that you can't believe that Jesus could do that for you. Look back and he used uh, Manasseh as one of the people that was forgiven for all the things that he had done. Well, Manasseh. 
or did he not repent? I think it was in Second Samuel. I may be drawing blank. Second Samuel twenty one seems to come to mind. Believe it or not, every now and then I draw a blank. I don't know. I didn't hear the sermon. <laughs> well, you've read about him, right? Yeah, Second Kings 21. Okay. And that's a range in Judah. Oh, the king. Okay, when you said Manasseh, I'm thinking Ephraim and Manasseh. Joseph's son. Okay, the king. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Go ahead. He did well. He just did all this evil, and he was saying, you know, look what all this king did, and he ended up repenting of that. So, where did he repent? Did he give that verse? Um, he, I'm sure he did, but I don't know. I just remember vaguely twenty-one, and then not second second. Well, you know, one book is enough. <laughs> you were close. Yeah. You meant well. You had a good, honest heart. But you were wrong. <laughs> what she paralleled. Saying that if God can forgive the <coughs> sins over here in second He's right. I'm I'm still dealing with this where we repent. And I don't see it in Second Kings twenty one. Does anybody see it in Second Kings twenty one? I'm commencing to begin to start my point here. Look at your marginal references. Do you have a parallel? What? All right. Now go to Second Chronicles thirty-three. See if you get more information. About verse ten. And Jehovah spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they would not listen. Therefore, Jehovah brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria who took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. Now, when he was in affliction, he did what? Now, what does that mean? He implored. What does that mean? Pleaded. Pleaded. That's prayer. He begged. He pleaded. He implored Jehovah his God, and what else did he do? Humbled himself. Humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers, and what else did he do? Prayed to him, and he, Jehovah, received his entreaty, heard his supplication, and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that Jehovah was God. All right? You see... If you put the two accounts together, you get all your information. So, your man was correct in his point yeah. that if God could forgive Manasseh and all the evil he did, but what you're going to need to do if you present that is show you people where God forgave. One chapter and verse. Did I not say 33? I'm sorry. Yeah, 33 and 20. I, I thought Alicia said it. I'm sorry. 33 starting verse 10. Now, you remember we were talking earlier, what's going to get you to change your mind? Evidence. 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 Here's the evidence. Evidence. Y'all didn't say evidence. 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 Evidence can lead people to change their minds about sin. 
It did when my mom and daddy applied affliction. John Wayne said the problem with this younger generation is they've never heard leather clear 11 Wrangler belt loops. Some of us heard it. And it didn't take hearing it but about one time that we kind of got the point. But affliction can sometimes bring about a change of mind. But that's evidence that God's, that's God doing what he told me to do. Good point. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. And thank you for bringing Manasseh up so I had to remember it and then go look it up. Thank you. I got another question. Uh, yes, sir. Lay a moment. I, I learned from you. Well, in, back in Leviticus 16 and verse 21, he uses iniquities and transgressions and sin. Those three. Am I thinking that they, they all mean the same, but do they... What's the reason? I wouldn't say it that way. Okay. I would say here are three different Hebrew words for sin, but they don't all mean exactly the same thing. Some of them mean willful transgression. Some mean the, the transgression itself or, or the, uh, the sacrifice for it, I believe. I'm shooting off the top of my head here. And then one of them means to miss the mark, like Harmontano or Harmontio does in the New Testament. So there are three words for sin, three words that represent sin, but they're representing three different aspects of sin. It's not the exact same thing. If they were the same thing, the answer to the question would be emphasis. But here, it's not emphasis as much as it's enumeration. All these things you've done Here's, here's the illustration of them. These three things represent every sin you've committed and every aspect of it. And that's what you're putting on the head of that goat. And that's what he's taking out of the camp. So if he took all of it, my, my argument is, if he took all of it, he didn't leave it. And so I don't see how it could be done in prospect when it was done here literally. And God said it was, and God said, if this doesn't take place, I can't dwell among them. That's the key right there. Yeah. That's the key. If he knew it was a forgiveness in prospect, he's saying, I can still dwell in this sin because I'm going to forgive you after Jesus dies. That won't make sense. That's holiness and unholiness. I mean, that's the problem I have with it. I'm sure some of these fellows would have an answer that we would need to deal with. And I think we can deal with it. But that's the problem I have with it. Uh, more comments, Elvin, on that? That's great. More questions or comments, Chip? Anything on that? That's good. Good. See, I learn. I learn as much from trying to answer questions as I do from trying to teach. So well, I, just, I gave you half a question and you answered the end of that. Well, I guess I'm, sure I'm sure he went to Second Chronicles. No, you aren't sure. <laughs> well, I can look it up. There you go. You, you hope he did. Yeah. But not necessarily. Sometimes when we're relating a Bible story, we don't always relate all of it. We just say, if God could forgive them, and we're implying, you know that he did. But, you know, I'm out on a limb. I'm, I'm me. If I imply that, I'd rather show you that than imply it. Because in my judgment, I don't believe the majority of my assembly knows it. So I'm presenting it as though I'm assuming you know it when I know in my mind most of you don't know it. Because you've never been... The Chronicles in your Bible because the gold is still intact around the edge. So I know you have. I'm being facetious. But I just know over 51 years of preaching how little people I've known and I've taught have ever studied these Old Testament passages. We've, we've just used them for Bible stories and illustra illustrations. But I, I guarantee you 
majority of the folks to whom he was preaching didn't know <clears throat> where they could go prove the master was for you. And if they did, I apologize to them in advance. So that's why I'm me. Okay, that's why y'all have to put up with me. I'd rather spend another 10 minutes showing you than have you assume something because I told you. That's why I want your questions and I want your comments because if what I'm telling you is not what this text says, y'all help me say what the text says or we're wasting our time. My opinion is not better than yours and, the, and yours is no good so that tells you how good mine is. <laughs> Forever, O Jehovah, in your word is settled in heaven. Let's take 10. The coat and the girdle in 2839. You shall skillfully weave the tunic of fine linen thread. You shall make the turban of fine linen. And you shall make the sash of woven work. So the coat in checker work was to be woven of fine linen. And one writer said, notice the way, the coat is an unfortunate translation. The ketoneth was a long white linen tunic. And you will notice that's the way the new King James renders it. Is the King James say tunic? Does it say tunic? The coat. The coat, okay. So he's saying that this word refers to a long white linen tunic or shirt having tight-fitting sleeves and reaching nearly to the feet. It was to be a fine twine linen, the girdle, the belt, the sash, blue, purple, and scarlet, work of the embroidery. We'll see, one writer said, this girdle and most of the shirt would not be seen by the people. Now notice that. But even so, the inner garments must also be sound since God sees, just as the motives of the believer must be pure, since God knows even our inmost thoughts. I thought that was a great quote and a good comparison. Most of the people never would see this tunic, other than probably the sleeves. But notice God gave detail as to how it's to be made. It's to be the best. To be just right. All right, any questions or comments on the garments of the high priest? Beginning in verse 40, we have the apparel for the sons of Aaron. For Aaron's sons, you shall make tunics, and you shall make sashes for them, and you shall make hats, headpieces, or turbans for them for glory and beauty. There be a fine linen work. In Exodus 39, And verse 27, they made tunics artistically woven of fine linen for Aaron and his sons. All right, go to Leviticus 8. And verse 13, then Moses brought Aaron's sons and put tunics on them girded them with sashes, sashes and put turbans or headpieces on them as Jehovah had commanded Moses. All right, then go to Ezekiel 44. Ezekiel 44, verse 17. See, Ezekiel saw a vision of the rebuilt temple. So that's why 
you have this material. Verse 17, Ezekiel 44. It shall be whenever they enter the gates of the inner court that they shall put on linen garments. No wool shall come upon them while they minister within the gates of the inner court or within the house. Right? So they have the coats, the tunics, the girdles, that's just the belt or sash. And what the American Standard refers to as goodly head tires. A cap of fine linen is to be made for them. You go back to Exodus 28 and verse 2. You shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother for glory and for beauty. Right here, with the priests, their caps of fine linen were to be made for glory and for beauty. In chapter 29 and verse 9, you shall gird them with sashes, Aaron and his sons, and put the hats on them. The priesthood shall be theirs for a perpetual statute. So you shall consecrate Aaron and his sons. Then in chapter 39, where we were a moment ago, this time in verse 28, a turban of fine linen, exquisite hats of fine linen, short trousers of fine woven linen. Then Leviticus 8 and 13, we read just a moment ago. So those worn by the ordinary priest, the turban is to be differentiated, different from the turban worn by the high priest. So the high priest has one, the other priests have one, but they're not the same, which sets the high priest apart. Then in verses 42 and 43 of chapter 28, you have the linen trousers. They're called breeches. I believe in the King James and the American Standard. Breeches. Now, when I grew up, I knew what breeches were. You say that now, and these young people won't have a clue. What are breeches? Our parents used to say, I'm going to tan the seat of your britches. We understood that. We knew where that seat was. And to what they were making reference. One lady came out one Sunday and said to the preacher, you greatly offended me today. And he said, I'm so sorry. What did I say that offended you? And she said, you said britches in your sermon. He said, I don't remember saying that. She said, you said it. It offended me. He said, I, that's not generally in my vocabulary. I don't remember saying it. You said it. He said, well, tell me, to help me understand why I said it, what I said just before I said bridges. He said, I don't know, but you said bridges. And that offended me. He said, well, I'm trying to see. Tell me what I said right after I said bridges. He said, I don't know, but you said bridges, and that offended me. He said, it's a good thing I said bridges, or you wouldn't have got the same world out of something. And I think I preached to that woman's sister. So you deal with these fine linen trousers, these bridges, 42 and 43. <coughs> You shall make for them linen trousers to cover their, what do you have there? Nakedness. Nakedness. Literally, or the idea of nakedness there, the bare flesh. They shall literally be from the waist to the thighs. I want you to notice that specification. They shall be on Aaron and on his sons. 
when they come into the tabernacle of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, that they do not incur iniquity, guilt. Their iniquity would be, could either be the sin or the guilt of the sin. And do what? Die. Die. It shall be a statute forever to him and his descendants after him. In this case, the wages of sin would be what? Death. Death. That's the Old Testament. Look at Leviticus 6. Verse 10. And the priest shall put on his linen garment and his linen trousers. He shall put on his body and take up the ashes of the burnt offering which the fire has consumed on the altar and he shall put them beside the altar. Notice when he's doing, working with ashes. He's to have his breeches on. In addition to his other garments. Look at Leviticus 16. I say Leviticus 16, what comes to mind? Day of Atonement. Okay. Leviticus 16.10. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before Jehovah to make atonement upon it and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. I read 10. I should have read 4. He shall put the holy linen tunic and the linen trousers on his body. He shall be girded with a linen sash and with a linen turban. He shall be attired. These are what? Holy garments. Therefore he shall wash his body in water and put them on. Notice you put holy garments on what kind of a body? Clean. Clean body. Good sermon. Holy garments on a clean body. When you become a Christian, you spiritually put on holy garments. And you are a clean body. You are a clean person. You need to really do some research and flesh that out if you use it. Then in Ezekiel 44, in that vision of the rebuilt temple, And verse 18, they shall have linen turbans on their heads and linen trousers on their body. They shall not clothe themselves with anything that causes sweat. Notice that. Unclean. Detail. Minute detail. That's how important this is. And people come along and say, your clothes don't say anything about you. Did these clothes say anything about the priest? Yeah, this is next to God's business. Yeah, that's that. Uh, so every tub shall sit on its own bottom. I think there's two verses below that. And that's in the New Imagination Version, chapter 1, verse 5. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and you heard it was from the Bible, but it's not. Well, I did. Well, a lot of us did. My people didn't say that. The Bible says cleanliness is next to godliness. The Bible says every tub shall sit on his own bottom. The Bible says as a twig is bent, so grows the tree. All those old sayings were said, many people thought they were Bible sayings. They were to be made of fine twine linen, verse 28 of chapter 39. <coughs> fine twine linen. Turban, a, a turban of fine linen, exquisite hats of fine linen, short trousers of fine woven linen. Notice they were to cover the flesh of the nakedness, nudity. 
especially the sexual organs of the priests. One writer said, modesty here would involve, now notice this, it should be involved on, involve on this slide. Modesty here would involve being covered from the loins, and that means the waist or the small of the back, middle of the body, and here's where a belt or linen cloth was fastened, 1 Kings 2, 5. From this part of the body, a soldier's sword was hung, 2 Samuel 20, verse 8. So it shall be from the waist, even unto the thighs, and the thigh is the proximal segment of the vertebrate hind limb, extending from the hip to the knee and supported by a single large bone. Alright, is to be from the waist to the thigh, which would take you to the knee. These breeches covered from the waist to the knee. Alright, in Genesis 3, that coat <coughs> It was a long garment with sleeves, just like Joseph's coat was a long garment with sleeves, covered the shoulders, generally down past the knees. It's my judgment, you hear that? That that's God's modesty standard. I believe that's consistent all the way through to keep the thigh coat. That doesn't matter if you're sitting, standing, squatting, jumping, running, lying, or whatever. Be covered from the shoulders to the knees. I guarantee you, you'll be modest. But those garments are not accentuating body parts. They are to be that which does not attract attention to sexuality. They are to be modest. People today say, well, you can't know what's modest. I can. Verse 43, they are to be upon Aaron and his sons when they go in unto the tent of meeting or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place. Now notice this. If they refuse to wear the linen breeches in these places, they would bear iniquity of all guilt, sin, for the refusal and die, both spiritual and physical death. This shows that God can be approached only by authorized people in authorized places through authorized means. I think that's important. I believe that has a New Testament application to us. Authorized people. Those are the people that are covered are the ones who can approach God. Those who have atonement made for them. By blood. In this case, animal blood. Authorized places. God didn't say you can just approach me any way you want to. Now you and I have that privilege because we have a once for all sacrifice. But God picked out a place, put his name there, and that's where they were to come to approach him. Unless they were separated from him and then they approached him by praying toward them kept in mind the place. Authorized means, you had to use the sacrifices he authorized. Had to be without blemish. No spot. Had to be a certain animal. So he couldn't bring a dog and offer a dog. Couldn't bring a rat and offer a rat. Couldn't bring a groundhog and offer a groundhog. Certain animals. Bring those lambs, those rams, those 
few lambs that to be brought. I believe that's the point we need to hammer to people. Are you authorized to approach God? Not to be a Christian. Are you approaching God through His authorized means, the blood of Christ, the specific acts of worship, the specific lifestyle of the Christian? If you pray, 1 Timothy 2, 9, I would the men, that's a near, the males, in mixed assemblies, pray in every place, lifting up what kind of hand? All right, you can't approach Him if your hands are, are dirty. There's a clean lifestyle there. And if you refuse to wear what I tell you to wear, you die. As far as I know, initially, only two had to die before somebody got the point. And Lord willing, one day maybe we can look at that. Another writer said, nor will God connive at the presumptions and irrever irreverences even of those whom he caused us to draw most near to him. If Aaron himself, high priest, put a slight upon the divine institution, he shall bear his iniquity and die. The high priest. So Aaron couldn't say, look at me. I'm the high priest. I can get away with things. You can't get away with them. <laughs> elders can't say, look at us. We're the elders. We can get away with sins. You can't get away with Preachers can't <laughs> say that. Deacons, Bible class teachers, mamas and daddies. We can't tell our children, I'm your mama. I'm your daddy. I can do sin that you can't do. Don't do what I do. You do what I say can't do that. And God won't put up with it. Our people today need to get the lesson. God will not put up with things that we decide to do <coughs> just because we're called Christians. If they refused to wear these britches, they died the priests, like the high priest, were involved in a high-risk occupation. Failed to do what God required while serving in God's house was a crime punishable by death. That ought to make us take stock when we come to worship. What am I presenting? How am I presenting it? John recorded it. Jesus said it. Two basic words cover all that. Spirit, right attitude. Truth, right actions. Approaching God by the authorized means. Be sure you're an authorized person. You know, there are certain places that if you're not authorized, you can't go. You see a sign, authorized personnel only. And you try to go in there, generally somebody's going to stop you. Or if they find you, they're going to take you out of there. Years ago, any of you remember the TV program Nashville Now? It was on the Nashville Network. Ralph Emery was the MC, and they had musical guests. We went. Our family went and others. And after the show, you could go up on the stage and meet the musicians and meet Ralph and, and meet the guests. And so we did. And somehow, Nancy and the youngins went one way, <coughs> and I went the other. And I thought I was going to the exit. And lo and behold, I ended up on the outside, there were a lot of trailers up there, and I figured out that was the dressing rooms of the stars, and here came Ralph walking down the sidewalk. Very gracious, we shook hands, we talked a few minutes, and I said, I'm turned around, can you tell me how to get out of here? 
And he very graciously did. See, I wasn't authorized to be back there. Had a security guard been back there, they would have probably not as graciously as Ralph did removed me. Get out of here. You don't belong here. All right? You don't want God to say to your worship, get out of here. Would God ever say to worshipers, get out of here? Could I prove that? Can I prove that? I think you could if you're a denomination. How can I prove it? Would God say that to his own people? How can I prove it? Go to Isaiah chapter 1. Somebody was fishing on that one. Apparently the fish didn't recognize the bait. Look at Isaiah 1, verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for Jehovah has spoken. I've nourished and brought up children, so that tells you they're children, they're in the family. And they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel, that tells you who the children are, does not know, my people do not consider. Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken Jehovah. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They turned away backward. Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it. Wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they've not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. Your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire, strangers devour your land in your presence, and it is desolate, it is overthrown by strangers. So the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard, as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city, Unless Jehovah of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. Hear the word of Jehovah, you rulers of Sodom. See, he takes that same comparison they made, that Isaiah made, Sodom and Gomorrah, then he makes application. Hear the word of Jehovah, you rulers of Sodom, you rulers of Israel. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. See, that's using that illustration. Now notice. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says Jehovah? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand? Trample my courts. Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are trouble to me. I am weary of bearing. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Did he tell his children, take your sacrifices and get out of here? Now you're at the temple. You're in my courts. Take your sacrifices and go home. And Joel will later turn that kind of presentation to Jehovah as rend your hearts not your garments, and I generally say, what Joel is saying is, quit playing church. They were playing church. Israel was playing church. And God said, go home. I don't want it. I want him say Now, when you come on Sunday, you want God to be saying, take your worship and go home. Number one, you aren't living right before you get here. Number two, when you get here, your attitude is not right. Or you're not worshiping according to the truth. So 
Kentucky sacrifices the Lord. And we don't want him to say that about our worship. We don't want him to say that about our daily lifestyle as we present ourselves a living sacrifice to him. So if you don't do what I tell you to do, he says to these priests, you will die. Verse 43, this was to be a statute forever alone or the priesthood. What's the terminus of alone here? I'm sorry. To the next priesthood law. Okay, give me a time. So your Old Testament Mosaic period goes from approximately Exodus 20 to Acts 1. Now try telling that to people who don't think. But my Bible says the New Testament right after Malachi. Uppercase C. Everything was made by the people chosen according to the pattern given by Moses or given to Moses by Jehovah on Sunday. Now that's chapter 39. And chapter 39 says whatever 28 and 29 told us to do, that's exactly, not nearly, that's exactly what we did. According to the pattern. This chapter stresses that everything was made according to the commandment of Jehovah. Go to 39. And I want, I'm going to give you some things to underscore or mark or make a note about if you're taking notes. <coughs> to stress this. Look at verse 1, the last part of verse 1. As Jehovah had commanded Moses. The end of verse 7. As Jehovah had commanded Moses. The end of verse 21. As Jehovah, as Jehovah had commanded Moses. Verse 26. As Jehovah had commanded Moses. Verse 29, as Jehovah had commanded Moses. Verse 31, as Jehovah had commanded Moses. Verse 42, according to all that Jehovah had commanded Moses. Verse 43, as Jehovah had commanded. You think that's there to say they didn't miss a bit? They didn't miss a stitch. They didn't miss a pomegranate. They didn't miss a bell. Whatever God said, do, that's what we did. Is what Moses writes. And, just like God said. So, you could take the requirements of these garments and the other parts, and you could take the garment and lay it down by the requirement, and it would fit exactly. There'd be no alteration needed. So, fellas, when you're teaching this, ladies, when you're teaching your boys and girls, that, those, that stress is there for a reason. It's teaching us the importance of doing what God said. And little boys and girls can get that. And the big boys and girls need to get it. All right, questions or comments now on the garments? Anyone? All right, in Exodus 28, 41, I know you probably thought I skipped that. You have the anointing and the consecration of the priesthood. So you shall put them on Aaron your brother and on his sons with him. You shall anoint 
and you shall anoint them, consecrate them, and set them apart, sanctify them, in order that they may minister to me as priests. Notice those three things. Anoint them, consecrate them, sanctify them. Which one of the three could you omit and these priests served lawfully? None. None. So you're studying with people and there are commandments to, in order to be saved and they're having problems with baptism and you list it as one of the commandments. Just go back here and say, which one of these three could be omitted and these priests function lawfully? They usually see that. They don't have anything to argue about. Well, if that were the case, then why is it not the case that we have to do all this to please him? Which one can we omit and be qualified? See? That's why I like the Old Testament, because it gives you so many illustrations that you use in Bible study in helping people see things. Right? The whole of chapter 29 deals with the consecration of the priesthood. You may have that over chapter 29 as a head note. And Leviticus chapter 8. Now, what Leviticus does... is tell you how what Jehovah said do in Exodus was done. So, I think you can see, can all of you read the chart? Can you see the chart? That you have Exodus 29, the instructions. So you have the bull for sin offering, the ram for burnt offering, Realm of ordination, the wave offering, the heave offering, Aaron's garments for his sons, and eating the consecrated food. All right, over here, Leviticus 8. Here's how it was done. Or here's the fact that it was done. So that ought to give you the idea when you're studying Exodus 29. You ought to also be studying Leviticus 8. Because there's the fulfillment of it. So you don't have to wait till you get through with Exodus 40 to start on Leviticus. You have parallels and things that help. So if you go to Leviticus 8, and Jehovah spoke to Moses, saying, All right now, if you mark spoke, drop down to verse 4. So Moses did as Jehovah what? Commanded. Mark spoke, Mark commanded, connect the two. The speaking was a commandment. One writer said, number one, the same God who instructed Moses how to build the tabernacle also told him how to ordain the priest and how the priest should serve in the tabernacle, and if you mark it in your notes, nothing was left to chance or to the imagination. Moses was to do everything according to what God had shown him on the mount. And we call that the what? What God had shown Moses on the mount was the pattern. Good. Pattern. <coughs> Number two, Moses officiated in this matter because no priest had previously been consecrated on the law. 
So we don't have a consecrated priesthood until now. Now, where are they when these instructions are given and carried out? They're Sunday. And they've been there since Exodus 19. See, now we're in Leviticus 8. All this takes place at Sinai. In this case, Moses acted as a priest. Moses is also identified as a prophet and as leader of Israel acted somewhat in the capacity that would later be filled by a king. In one sense, get that, one sense, Moses served as prophet, priest, and king in Israel. This would picture the roles <laughs> occupied by Jesus when he came as Messiah. You know the song, Jesus is my prophet, Jesus is my priest, Jesus is my king. Jesus is my prophet, priest, and king. Of him I would know, for him I would show, and teach to the world. He is supreme. So here you have Jesus ruling and reigning. Leviticus number 3, 8 through 10, and 24, 10 to 23 are the only narrative sections in Leviticus. Now notice this. They follow the storyline of Exodus. Number 4, this performance of the command of Jehovah ties together Leviticus 8 and Exodus 28 and 29. Now that's a bit of information that most of our people don't have. So you can see why I get on my soapbox about studying Genesis this quarter and Ephesians the next. We leave our people without continuity, without seeing the continuity. And it hurts when you're trying to develop a theme or a thought that God develops through the scriptures and the folks to whom you're talking don't have that theme never seen that thing come all the way through. So, if the Lord lets the earth stand, I hope whoever hears this will try to do a better job in the Bible class program of teaching people the scheme and helping people to see the continuity that ties together. Until I saw it, there were a lot of things that didn't make sense. I couldn't explain. I didn't understand. When I saw it, it opened up. Oh, that's how that ties to that. And some of you have seen some of that. And you appreciate it when you see it. And it helps you. And that takes years to do. You won't do that in the 30-minute Bible class two times a week. You have to work on it. I'm off my soapbox now. Number five, one writer said, as the consecration of Aaron and his sons to the priesthood was to be accompanied by different kinds of sacrifices, it was first of all necessary to define the ritual of each sacrifice. This was therefore done in chapters 1 through 7. So in 1 through 7, you have those five sacrifices offered in Israel. All right, you learn what they are. Then you get to chapter 8, you consecrate the priesthood. Now they start offering those sacrifices. So when you read about a sin offering, a trespass offering, a plank offering, a drink offering, now you know what they are when you cover those first seven chapters. In 2841, as I read, the instructions are given to Moses. 
Moses is instructed to put these clothes on Aaron and his sons in order for them to serve in the priesthood. The point there is, if they aren't wearing the clothes, they cannot serve in the priesthood and be accepted to God or offer a single sacrifice for the people that will be accepted. And you think about where how that fits in what we do in worship. Think about the song leader. If the song leader leads songs nobody knows in worship, how is he going to lead those people to approach Jehovah? It's not wrong to sing a new song. How great thou art, but at one time was a new song. Nobody ever heard it. But what we need to do, and I'm so thankful when I came here, y'all were already trying to do it, is to help people understand what the words in the song are, what they mean. I sang for years. Here I raised my Ebenezer, and I didn't know what I was supposed to be raising. How about you? Nobody told me what an Ebenezer was. And yet I'm saying I'm raising one, see? So the priests were to help the people understand their approach to God, to make it make sense to them. So they're not just standing on the outside of the court handing over lambs that don't mean anything. See, there's a difference in observing the Lord's Supper and eating a cracker and drinking grapes. There's a difference. And that's what the priesthood did. They helped the people to worship make sense to them. And so when they brought that sacrifice, they could see it, not as leading a lamb to the gate of the tabernacle and handing it over to a priest. They could see that as coming to approach Jehovah. So they're not just standing out there and couldn't get any closer thinking I didn't get anything out of that. That didn't mean anything to me. You ever heard people leave a worship service and say, I didn't get a thing in the world out of that? Why? See? Why? Because what you were doing didn't make sense to you. You were just doing something. So, we as leaders, elders, preachers, Bible class, class teachers, need to help our people see how their worship makes sense. And that's true with the prayers, the singing, the giving. How many people see any kind of connection to giving and approaching God? How often when we talk about the giving, do we talk about we approach God through our giving. We're not giving it back to Him. We're using it the way He told us to do it. And one of those was to approach Him through giving. When Ananias and Sapphira lied about their contribution, to whom did they lie? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Why? That giving was an approach to God. They were given to help poor people. That was the benevolent approach. But it was an approach to God. Acts 2 and 42, the early church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and the what? Fellowship. Fellowship involved giving. And don't we, when we preach on that, say, here's the worship outline? Fellowship involves giving. It involves the same. So here, the priests, are consecrated, set apart, to help the people in worship make sense to them as they approach Jehovah. Moses is to anoint, the Hebrew word moshach, to rub with oil. It used for the ceremonial induction into leadership offices, an action which involved the pouring of oil from a horn upon the head of an individual 
to anoint an individual indicated an authorized separation for God's service. So he is to anoint them. That wasn't just pouring oil on somebody. It had a meaning. Moses is to consecrate, mole, to fill, fill their hand. Used figuratively here for an institute to a priestly office. Consecrate. This is the same word translated filled in verse 3. When Aaron and his sons were consecrated, their hands were filled. Some say they were filled with sacrifice. They could devote themselves to nothing else because their hands were full. When a priest was consecrated, his hands were filled with ministry. That helps me. Why? Am I not as susceptible to sin as somebody in the world? Because I am full-handed living the Christian life. And when I fail to do it, it's because I've dropped something. Now my hands are in. So Christianity is having your hands full, living Christian, living the Christian life. Don't we say Christianity is a full-time job? And isn't it the case? It's a handful.